Welcome to Lucknow and to this episode of Eureka, we are going to have a very wonderful, very informative conversation with Dr. Anil Kumar Tripathi, who is the Director of Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants, SASAR Institute in Lucknow. Before we continue this conversation, let's take a quick look at his brief profile. Keep watching Eureka. Aroma Mission has been launched with the ambition of making India to emerge as global leader in the production of essential oils extracted from aromatic crops. It's where Professor Anil Kumar Tripathi has been heading this mission, who says that Aroma Mission will also boost the income of farmers. Currently, Professor Tripathi is the director of CSIR, Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants at Lucknow. Before joining his present position at Lucknow in February 2014, he was a professor of biotechnology and coordinator, functional genomics group, interdisciplinary school of life sciences at Banaras Hindu University. He did his MSc and PhD in Botany from Banaras Hindu University and has 30 years of postgraduate teaching as well as research experience in biotechnology. Professor Tripathi has made notable contributions by identifying and characterizing nitrogen-fixing bacteria which support the growth of important grasses that inhibit desiccating desert. He was also the first from India to show the occurrence of Ralstonia as microsymbiont colonizing the legume nodules. Professor Anil Kumar Tripathi received many prestigious awards. Noted among them is a Young Scientist Award of Indian Science Congress Association and Career Award of UGC. He is a Fellow of Indian National Science Academy, National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, amongst others. Thank you. It's been a very wonderful uh, opportunity. Your institute looks very, uh, I should say, aromatic, very uh, nice smelling. Uh, let's start with uh, your background. I mean, you came to this institute uh, recently, but before that you have been uh, spearheading a number of interesting programs in uh, Banaras Hindu University. So, can you tell us some of the major work that you did in Banaras Hindu University? You see, I uh, joined CMAP in 2014, February 2014 uh, to be precise. Uh, before that, I was at uh, Banaras Hindu University. And Banaras Hindu University happens to be my alma mater. Also. I, I was even a student of that university. And later on, I joined there as a faculty. My, you know, as a faculty, you have two major responsibilities. One is teaching, another is research. And uh, as part of my teaching program, I have been teaching genetics, molecular biology, genetic engineering, and also environmental biotechnology to the master's students, basically. And as part of my research, I have uh, continued to explore the areas of research based on my curiosity and based on the possibilities. Mm -hmm. So initially when I joined, the infrastructure was very limiting because universities have very limited uh, resources. So I always feel that the research is art of doing feasible things. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, I started working on biodiversity microbial biodiversity, which is associated with different plants, uh -huh. including plants living in the deep water. Some of the rice, for example, which lives in the uh, deep water, it is cultivated. And on the other extreme, we went to the Thar Desert in Jaisalmer and to find out the question that how the plants are surviving, where from they are getting nitrogen and other nutrients. Mm -hmm. Are there bacteria which are contributing there? So that was very interesting, uh, you know, study where we, we were able to identify the bacterial community which was contributing for the plant growth. See, one thing uh, most of us would know, I mean, at least uh, today, given uh, the kind of messages that we are getting, that uh, what we thought earlier, bacteria immediately means germs and something uh, not desirable. That's not what we now think. I mean, we know that there are good bacteria which are essential for our own health. Right, right, right. Do you say that uh, similarly there is some kind of a symbiosis between uh, bacteria and plants also? Well, of course, because, uh, uh, I mean, it is now a known fact that every organism, every higher organism, what you say, mm. contains a major portion of bacterial community. Okay. Uh -huh. Almost in every part of our, our body, mm. we have bacterial community. And mm. similarly, 
all living organisms. Mm. Whether it is Likewise, plant or anything. Yes, oh. exactly. Mm. Mm. And in plants, we have some bacteria which are associated outside the plant, mm. like around root, we call rhizosphere bacteria. Mm. And the bacteria which is around uh, you know, leaves, they are called phyllosphere bacteria. And there are ma majority of bacteria which are living inside. Inside the plant. Inside the plant. Okay. Uh -huh. They are called endophytes. Something and like, for example, bacteria which lives in our guts. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. they are there uh, living inside the plant. And those who are very intimately related, they are called symbiotic. They have symbiotic relationship, which is a reciprocal mutual relationship. So these are the different types of See, bacteria. in uh, uh, animals and human beings, I mean, uh, the gut bacteria, for example, is uh, essential for digestion. I mean, without that, uh, uh, I mean, many of the things that we consume is not broken into parts which can be, you know, absorbed by your body. Yeah. What kind of contribution does these microbes make to the plants? See, uh, my focus has been on nitrogen fixation. Okay. And biological nitrogen fixation is a very important process mm -hmm. Uh, which has led to the evolution of life on the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, evolution of the carbon fixation, mm -hmm. the nitrogen fixation is another very important process because of the, for the evolution. And these days we are using mm -hmm. petroleum hydrocarbons to produce uh, nitrogenous fertilizers yeah. and uh, we are polluting our fields. Mm -hmm. Now the effort has been for last several decades, there are a lot of groups which are working and we are also part of the same uh, pursuit to find out the bugs, the bacteria, which can promote plant growth by producing some kind of hormones which promote uh, root proliferation mm -hmm. and they provide nitrogen, fixed nitrogen. They f take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into assimilable form of nitrogen which goes and benefits to the plants. So basically you want uh, to produce fertilizer at the roots rather than in some factories. Well, uh, in a sense, uh, I would not like to put it that way. That it's not that simplistic, but uh, uh, to develop or to nurture that kind of relationships which are already existing in the nature. What has happened during the last several years, the rice has been bred for consuming more nitrogen. Mm. There used to be rice varieties earlier which were fixing nitrogen. Their endophytes were fixing, but they were slow growing and therefore they have been bred out. Mm. And the ones which are in the current practices, they are very efficient in consuming nitrogen fertilizers. Mm. And we are still emphasizing on nitrogen use efficiency. Mm -hmm. So this has been one part of my research, but uh, I have tried to go deeper also into one bacterium mm -hmm. that we are able to see, we are able to smell, we are able to feel the temperature. How does a bacterium do that? Okay. That mm -hmm. is something very fundamental mm -hmm. because very often when we inoculate plants for a positive response, some plants respond, some do not. So we do not know how the bacterium is behaving. Mm -hmm. And therefore we ask this fundamental question that how does bacterium sense that it's high temperature outside or low temperature, whether it's a salt outside or no salt, mm -hmm. whether there's a light outside or no light, because all these things affect the life of the bacteria and therefore it's important for uh, bacterium to understand it. And we have been working on a system called sigma factors, which okay. are responsible for transcription process, mm -hmm. initiating transcription. So this decides which gene has to undergo expression. Mm. And therefore, it's very crucial. After sensing environment, this is the crucial step. Sigma factor is the crucial step that which genes are to be transcribed or expressed, which are not. And therefore, there are two dozen sigma factors. Mm. Mm. In E. coli, there are only seven sigma factors. Mm. But in my bacterium, which is my favorite, which is called azospirillum, there are 23 sigma factors. And we're trying to understand that how does there are cascades of regulation and there is a complete network of regulation. And using all this, we are trying to understand the systems biology of this bacterium so that we can make use of this systems biology towards synthetic biology. For okay. example, okay. bacterium has a potential to produce variety of chemicals which are produced by plants. Mm -hmm. For example, in uh, uh, University of Berkeley, Jay Kiesling has been able to show that a uh, anti-malarial, amorphodine or uh, artemisinin can be produced in a bacterium, in E. coli. Mm -hmm. We are trying to produce it in azospirillum because we have understood the organism well. Now we know completely the, uh, its regulatory system and therefore a plant gene can be expressed in bacteria and its metabolite can be produced. So, so one can actually uh, make an industrial kind of a production of but uh, using biomethods. Exactly, that's exactly. A, that's because this is a kind of platform on which not only amorphodine, a variety of secondary metabolites can be produced from bacteria. Because in the field, plant has to take three months, six months, one year. 
but in bacteria in a fermenter you can grow it in a larger scale yeah, and that also is, in a short time that's that right, is the advantage right. of the synthetic biology thank you abin this is where we'll take a very short break we'll take a very short break keep watching urika we'll continue this conversation after a very short break Welcome back to Eureka. We are having a very wonderful conversation with Dr. Anil Kumar Tripathi, who is the director of Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants in Lucknow. This institute uh, is 60 years old. I mean, it's uh, celebrating its uh, diamond jubilee. I saw lots of uh, banners and posters. Uh, I'm sure uh, the whole institution is uh, proud of its uh, achievements. Of course, of course. So, yes. can you share some of the major achievements this, this institute has done in the last 50, 60 years? Yes, I think uh, there are two very major things. There are actually several, but if uh, you ask me to choose one or two, mm -hmm. I would say that about 30 years back, India was importing menthol, yeah, and uh -huh. menthol, which mm -hmm. is used in cough syrup, in the toothpaste, and variety of other applications, this is an ingredient which was being imported, and our visionary directors. they thought about can we cultivate this plant mm. which is called mentha arvensis this is a japanese mint mm. they brought it from outside they started cultivating it and they realized that farmers can benefit from it but there were certain limitations with this plant which was taking longer time to mature so farmer had to sacrifice one crop in order to have mentha cultivated what we our scientists did that they developed varieties which were of shorter duration okay so after the harvest of ravi mm. when there is a 2 3 months time before they plant paddy 2 3 months time was there and our crop precisely fits during this period okay. so this is a third additional bonus crop which farmers were able to take okay. and there we developed high yielding varieties agronomic practices processing technologies distillation technologies and above all the deployment we have a very strong team which will go out to the field interact with the farmers and they will you know convince farmers and that is why during last two decades mm. the india is the largest producer and exporter of menthol mint oil in the world you mean to say that 30 years ago we were importing for our exactly. own use exactly and uh, uh, in the last about for two decades we are not only the biggest producer but we also one of the, the largest major exporter, exporter. yes huh? 80% of the global mm. menthol production natural menthol production is done in india and out of that i am happy to say that out of that 80% 80% is produced in up okay so uh -huh. the farmers have greatly been benefited uh, by so by that. whenever i have a menthol uh, let's say uh, chewing gum or something like that i'm actually uh, always always remember that you are uh, you know tasting cmaps contribution that's that's a, that's a very very interesting point may i think most people will not even know such things right yeah so i uh, we have, we are trying to you know uh, actually people in the north india those who are into mentha they just yes. know cmap very well and uh, the second very important contribution which we have made is regarding development of uh, anti malarial you know the cerebral malaria the deadliest kind of malaria and thousands of people were dying in india at that time again in Our fact actually one of the study in india yeah. shows that if you look at the deadliest animal in india yes it's not uh, tiger yes it's not lion right it's not even snakes right it is mosquitoes that's right the people who die because of mosquito bite is much much more than any other uh, animal affect i think uh, what you said precisely that was the thought in the process of our visionary former directors mm -hmm. and uh, cmap together with cdri mm. they decided that let us try to cultivate this plant artemisia annua mm. and they somehow brought some seeds mm. from uh, i think world health organization mm. kew garden they started growing it here it was not indian plant it was a chinese plant yeah. you know you you too madam she was awarded nobel prize but she had done the very very nice fundamental research but actual translational potential was realized in india because cmap developed varieties of artemisia annua increase its artemisinin content from 0.1% to 1.2%. Okay, 0.1 to 1.2. It will be uh, 10 times, 10 times. about okay. 12 times, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. And uh, not only developing variety but developing process technology for generating kilogram quantities quantities of artemisinin mm. and then chemical processes for developing its stable, you know, uh, derivatives. Mm -hmm. And then we work together with CDRI. CDRI put its effort into the drug development 
and ultimately they also collaborated with the Malaria Research Center and eventually the most effective drug against cerebral malaria came out which is based on the alpha beta r tether. This is the final product which is a transform product of the amorphodine. So this is the, uh, it was transferred to the companies and millions of people's lives in India and in Africa was saved because of this development and this contribution. This, uh, whenever uh, somebody gets a serious malaria, they are given ART treatment. Exactly, ART, ART. Yeah, RT. right. So, yes. I believe from what you say that uh, unknowingly they are actually getting benefited from CMAP. CMAP, CDRI and there are other institutions. There, yeah, course, uh. But the basic, our effort was to make in India. We should not depend on China or for example other country. We should be able to grow the raw material in India, extract the artemisinin within India and then the drug development. Because after all, I mean, it's uh, malaria is one of the very commonest diseases even now in India, right? I yes. mean, which is uh, deadliest. If we have not developed this, uh -huh. the cost of artemisinin globally would have much higher. Because we have the capability, the Chinese have kept the prices low. Not only that, I think uh, because we are now able to supply this medicine at cheaper prices to Africa, right. we are also averting a world crisis, right? Of course, of course. That's, of that's course. also, I think, a very important contribution that uh, we should not forget. I mean, precisely, uh, precisely. most of Africa survives because of uh, drugs, affordable drugs from India. Exactly. exactly. That's, uh, that's, I think, uh, a very important point. Perhaps this is where we will take... We are a, very, very proud of yeah. uh, our contribution in that respect. Yeah. I think we will take a very short break here. Keep watching Reka, we'll continue this conversation after a short break. Welcome back to Reka. We are having a very wonderful, very informative conversation with Dr. Anil Kumal Tripathi, who is the Director of Central Institute of Medicinal and Aromatic Plants, a CSAR institute in Lucknow. Your institute says medicinal plants, which of course we can all understand, and also aromatic plants. What is it actually? See, uh Medicinal and aromatic plants research at CMAP has been focused around empowering farmers for their greater profit. Mm -hmm. Because medicinal plants go to the traditional systems of medicine because there is a deficiency, lack of availability of the desired medicinal plants to, to support and strengthen the traditional systems of medicine. So that goes into the Ayurvedic industry. Okay. But aromatic crops, they go into the aroma industry. They are again industrial crops which bring a lot of benefit to the farmers. Mm -hmm. The advantage of aromatic crops is that aroma industry, the global aroma industry is in need of these essential oils and their ingredients, aroma ingredients. Say like aroma is like, for example, you might say lemongrass yes, is a yes, aroma. Yes, yes, or exactly. what are the major aroma, I mean, uh, plants that we are growing yes, in India? Yes, I think uh, we have a, a list of plants. You have already mentioned one, lemongrass. But our major aromatic crop has been mentha mm -hmm. and thereafter we have been working on lemongrass mm -hmm. and palmarosa mm -hmm. and vetiver, mm -hmm. pacholi mm -hmm. and there are a series of other uh, aromatic crops. Okay. But these are the major crops on which we are focusing because uh, these crops are such which are a great support to the farmers. For example, if the land is affected by salinity, you grow vetiver or palmarosa. Mm -hmm. If the land is affected by drought or low water, water availability, you go Prama Rosa and lemongrass. These crops are also not grazed by animals. Okay. That is the advantage. Okay. 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 So the farmers very often are you know, afraid that the uh, animals will uh, destroy the crop. So uh, for example, we have positioned these crops in Vidarbha mm. and Bundelkhand where mm. farmers mm. were committing suicide. We have developed high yielding varieties, for example, lemongrass variety. 80% of the lemongrass grown in India commercially, it is our variety, okay. CMAP variety. Okay. Okay. And we continue to improve the yield of mm. essential oils and their citral content so that aroma industry continues to benefit and also in turn farmer also continues to benefit. So these are, you know, uh, some of the crops, vetiver, we have started in the coastal area you might be aware of tsunami affected area of Kadalur. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we had gone, they were cultivating vetiver and they were getting 0.3% oil from their roots. Okay. Our variety had 1.6%. Okay. Uh -huh. We deployed our variety all the way from Pantanagar to Kadalur, and now farmers are very happy. The farmers who were selling their roots for 100 rupees, the buyers are now fighting for purchasing it 200 rupees okay. or 250 rupees. Okay. 
So that so is doubling the kind income of is kind of uh, indirectly. Uh, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. So the the advantage is that if it's a flood affected mm -hmm. area, like uh, there are river banks are there, mm -hmm. farmers are not growing anything because their crop will get destroyed because of the flood. Whatever is the crop, which sustains flood situation. Okay. So I had been to one of the uh, farmers' field uh, in one of the villages, and a farmer who was cultivating vetiver on the bank of the river. Uh, he was earning about 90,000 to 1 lakh rupees per acre, okay. whereas the traditional farmers with their rice and ped, uh, this paddy and uh, wheat, they were uh, earning about 25 to 30,000 rupees per, ma uh, per year, per acre. Mm. So you can see about three times yeah. difference in their uh, income. So they were convinced, they are getting gradually convinced. And uh, our also uh, focus is that we organize a Kisan Mela mm. Mm. on 31st of January every year. And the number of farmers participating in this Kisan Mela is increasing every year. <coughs> From 2,500 in uh, 2014, uh, last Kisan Mela witnessed the participation of about 7,000 farmers. Okay, that's a, that's a and good. this is because we care for the farmers. All our scientists, they take this as a festival in which we prepare the mentha roots mm. for distribution to the farmers. We cultivate it at the Pantanagar farm, which is about 117 hectare. That is our lifeline from where we get planting material, we uh, get it here. So the uh, Pantanagar, we have four centers, mm -hmm. uh, one in Bangalore, another Hyderabad, and uh, Pantanagar is our major center, mm -hmm. uh, where we have about 117 hectare land, where we get good quality planting material produced for distribution all around the country. Okay, okay. And uh, that center is also giving us great support. It's like a lifeline for us, mm -hmm. because CSIR mm -hmm. has recently launched our Arma mission. Ah, okay. And in this Aroma mission, uh, the CMAP is leading the Aroma mission and other participating labs include in, uh, Institute of Himalayan Biosource Technology at Palampur mm -hmm. and the Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine at uh, Jammu mm -hmm. and our NIST at Jorhat mm -hmm. and another lab in Lucknow, National Botanical Research Institute. So all these five labs are coordinating in spearheading this uh, Aroma mission and the baton for, to lead this mission has been given to CMAP because of our past performance in Mentha. What is the main goal of this mission? I mean, what, what see, do you aim from this? See, the, uh, I think the CSIR had a you know, farsight of thinking about the farmers because gradually because of the climate change, the traditional agriculture is getting affected, their productivity is getting compromised. And under the situation, aromatic crops have a lot of promise that if the farmers, if farmers have to be you know, persuaded to continue to the cultivation, their agriculture has to be made profitable. Okay. So okay. they can cultivate traditional things, but they should also have an option of earning some good amount so, of so money. So if you make a kind of a mixture, <laughs> then uh, maybe the agriculture can perhaps see exactly. a... Exactly. So the, the idea is that they should also use part of their land for cultivation of aromatic mm. crops, which are more profitable. Climate variation doesn't affect it, mm. and uh, they get good return out of that. So this is one important area. So the CSR vision was that can we pan India in different states, depending upon the agroclimatic situation, recommend specific varieties of crops and uh, demonstrate their success so that the farmers can get inspired and replicate it in their respective fields. So at the moment, our target is approximately cultivation of 6,000 okay. hectare mm -hmm. of the aromatic crops all over India. But this will be the, with our direct intervention <clears throat> because we provide improved varieties, planting material, we provide even distillation unit, we provide buyback facility, the uh, okay. marketing facility, okay. uh -huh. so that farmers are happy. You, you are looking at something like 6,000 hectares. 6,000 hectare to begin with. But, uh, but what this, is the current level now? Uh, see, it is one year, we have initiated the program and we have been able to achieve 1,700 hectare in the first year itself. And we expect every other year the area to multiply by three to five times. Okay. So yeah. we will be surpassing our target by miles. This is this, is, is, our, is, a, this is our expectation. Okay. Very interesting point. I mean, we don't have much time, but then uh, this one question, I suppose, is very, very important. Uh, when this institute was started about 60 years ago, uh, India was in a different state. Our uh, situation was different. Maybe even our uh, needs were very different. I mean, immediate needs were different. Now we have entered into 21st century. We need to look ahead. I mean, we need to look for future. Right. So, what is the new direction, new vision, new path you think uh, CMAP should take? See, uh, our Prime Minister's concern has been that we have been the largest exporter of raw material. Mm. Now, Prime Minister expects that we 
should be able to export the value-added material, not the raw material. Not just raw. Mm -hmm. We are providing raw material like castor oil. Prime Minister himself has cited this example. We are exporting, we are largest producer of castor oil globally. Mm. We are exporting it and we are importing some flavor ingredients which are 900 times more costlier. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We are having such a, you know, huge scientific manpower. We have the capability and we have taken this task that we will be able to convert this castor oil into decalectones, which are the flavor material, which are about 900 times costlier. We should be able to do this instead of exporting castor oil, we should be in a position to export decalectone. Mm -hmm. and so similarly, we are trying to use not because our industry people are very content exporting essential oils. Yeah. We want to coax them to take up some of the technologies which we have developed and we are developing for extraction, fractionation of the aroma ingredient and do further modification to make it more valuable and then to export it. They have to invest, industry has to invest the money in the infrastructure so that we become leader, not in raw material export, but in the value added product export. So that the more employment can be generated, more, uh, in, I mean, industrial growth can more happen. More employment, right? more return to your effort, yeah. uh -huh. more return to your labor, and that will eventually percolate down to the farmers as well. So that is our future vision that we have to expand the base of cultivation, but along with that, we have to see that we developed value addition possibilities and we ensure that value addition takes place so that we emerge as a, you know, exporter of the value added products, not just not only, only the raw material. Exactly. That's, I think, a very, very interesting point. And with this, we need to end this uh, conversation here for lack of time. Keep watching Eureka. We'll come back with another interesting conversation next week. Thank you, sir, for being with us in the show. It's been a very wonderful, very informative and very thought-provoking uh, discussions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.